Hey there, I'm Jo, and this is Looking Outside. Join me and some of the most influential and original thinkers in business and beyond as we explore fresh takes on familiar topics. Hey, everyone. We are having one of my favorite types of conversations today. We're talking about what it means to be truly curious and open with an appetite for learning. I'm incredibly excited to have this chat with someone who has an incredible background and approach to life, Marcel Brown. Welcome to the show, Marcel. Hello, Joe, and thank you for having me in your podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, So I was going to introduce you as a trained pharmacist, forensic accountant, but you've done so many different things in your life and career. So maybe let's start with a little bit of an introduction about how you would describe yourself. Well, you're right. I'm a pharmacist. I'm a trained pharmacist. I studied pharmacy in Basel and did an exchange, an Erasmus exchange in London. And then after studying, I drifted somehow into the NGO world, working in different countries in uh, healthcare systems, supporting healthcare systems, improving healthcare systems, and then uh, decided to go into the forensic accounting to improve the, the money flow in this project, so to speak. So I got into this bit by coincidence. And then over the years, I I've moved more into the CSR world and became a philanthropic specialist or donations foundation specialist, supporting major companies basically in their investment in society, the CSR work, philanthropic work. And so today I'm heading the the newly opened Novartis exhibition in Basel. I'm the director of the exhibition uh, Wonders of Medicine, where we explain what the industry does and how research works today in the pharmaceutical business. Amazing. And that's where Marcel and I actually met was in a very rare opportunity for me inside of the pavilion at Nevada's in Basel in Switzerland. It was incredible. I was absolutely wowed by the display there. But I think what more so struck me was the stories that you were giving me when we were walking through it is the, the history, the context behind what we were engaging with. I mean, even just the fact that you have a pavilion that that kind of demonstrates the wonder of medicine and the history of the pharmaceutical industry and its impact, not only on Switzerland, but on the world. I mean, it's such a, a unique part of the world and that's what you get to deal with day to day. Yes, I feel a bit like um, Judy Garland, I think, in <laughs> on the yellow brick road. I always say that the work, the way to work, if you see the way to the pavilion, it's in the middle of a park in a nicely arranged park. And it's a small road going towards that building. And it's in the, it's like this way to the Emerald Crystal um, Palace. Yeah, the Wizard of Oz. And then you get in there and there are just so many discoveries and there's parts in the pavilion, which is about history, but then also about the future, which obviously really interested me. So it's a really unique place. And so you mentioned that you're kind of leading the exhibition part of the pavilion. And that's quite a deviation, I think, from where you started off saying, you know, that you, you're a trained pharmacist and studying, mm. studying medicine. So is it, firstly, is it surprising for you where you started and where you are today? Well, in a bit, how are the odds that all the thi- one person can do all the things I did? Mm. I've got to mention that I also was uh, in the South Pacific as a head pharmacist of a small island country in the South Pacific. So I did many things that are the dreams of, and I have several hats on or several careers. So yes, it's surprising, but I think it's not surprising that I'm now heading this exhibition and was working on this exhibition, because for me, it's a continuation of what I did before. It sounds a bit strange and a deviation, but it's always in the area of explaining medicines, explaining uh, treatments, explaining science. If you're a pharmacist, in the pharmacy, you have clients coming in, patients coming in, people with questions, you have have to explain their treatments, you have to explain why they have to take something eventually or how they have to take it, how does it work. So you have to boil it down to the essence, simplify things that the normal average layman has an idea what what this medicine is about, as Mm. doctors often don't have really the time to explain it. Or, or the patients have um, second thoughts, questions, and they cannot always go back to the doctor. So in Switzerland, at least, the pharmacist is a go-to place if you have questions on, on your health or well-being. And 
if you think about this, that what we do now is a bit the same. We give offer a platform where people can get information about health, about well-being. What is it to be a patient? What is a patient exactly? Who defines what is a disease? And how is the research done to develop a new medicine? Mm. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. Uh, the role of the pharmacist, I think, is quite different in different parts of the world. Like the expectation of what kind of service they provide is quite different, like particularly in the US, but then you go to the European markets and you're right, they almost act as like a little bit of a pseudo doctor in a way. Like they provide you with real medical advice and guidance that's a little bit exactly. more serious. Exactly. So in Switzerland, for example, you you have uh, the right to give medicines that are normally prescribed, mm. but then you you are in charge for the for the result of it, or you have to take the risks. If somebody, uh, if a tourist comes in, forgets his, his medicine or for the heart, his heart disease, his heart condition, you're allowed to give this, but then it's on your watch, so to speak. And the pharmacist has quite some, some rights, but also then of course is takes the risk. In other countries, the more north you go in Europe, the less possibilities the pharmacist has. And the more south you go, the more he has. You can give out much more medicines as a pharmacist. And also uh, producing medicines, we learned by hand how to make ointments, creams, pills, tablets, various formulations. And I realized that some place in the world, you really don't know how the basics work as we, what we call the basics of producing a medicine. So that was a bit an eye opener when traveling and working in different countries, how different this, this perceived one profession is worldwide. Right. Yeah, of course. And you mentioned this before that you have worked in the field or in related fields to do with biology, chemistry, pharmaceuticals and beyond across different parts of the world. So how many countries have you lived in? What do you consider living in? I, mean, I was six months in, in the UK, in London. Mm -hmm. I was um, six months in Tajikistan, Central Asia. I was six months in Vietnam, two years in Vanuatu. And when I was working for Ernst Young, for example, I went several weeks to different countries. So I was uh, six weeks in Poland, in Warsaw. I was about six weeks in a row in in Nashville, Tennessee. I didn't live there. But I, if you, go, you were in a hotel, basically, but it's not living. So living for me is really when you move your papers and you really are officially registered. So I was also six months in Berlin, but I was on a weekly base, Monday in, Friday out. But you can also get gifts, get some ideas of different cities. So I was, I counted it once in average, the last, before COVID, the last two years in at Novartis where I'm working now, I was 14 weeks per year out in different <laughs> countries. <laughs> and in that case, mainly in Africa. Wow. So Nigeria, mm. Zambia, Zanzibar. And now you're living in Switzerland, in Basel. Exactly. Okay. Do you feel settled now where you are and are you enjoying the fact that you are settled in one place or are you itching to go and immerse yourself in a different culture? I'm loving to travel, I have to say, but now having kids and uh, it, traveling is different and I don't have the urge I have to travel because I saw really many things and many countries. I always want to go back to see how it evolved, of course, but it's not that I really have the, the need to be somewhere else. I'm quite happy because I enjoy more what I have. So you start to appreciate some things at home more and more, the more you travel. And to give an example in Switzerland, tap water, something so simple, we would think that's the normal given thing every day. You just open your tap and drink the water from the tap. And if you travel around, you realize how precious this is. Mm. And we have all over the place, even the fountains in the city, you can drink wherever you want the water. And it's really Fabulous. <laughs> and these are the things you start to appreciate and, and, and cherish. The same is um, the tram system and the train system. They're really working on the second, on the minute. And if something is late, you can bet there's another one jumping in, another train coming. <laughs> uh, the trams are coming every seven minutes and people start already <laughs> a bit morning around if it's one minute late. I have access to healthcare 24 hours, 365 days a year to really good trained healthcare professionals at a high super quality. And that's also not a given. And I had in Vietnam, for example, I had a appendicitis, acute appendicitis. I had to have an operation, emergency operation. It all worked well, but that was also a moment when you realize um, how you take some things for granted, then you realize in different countries that it's not that easy to get healthcare support, especially if you need it fast and quick. 
Yeah, it's it's very interesting as well because healthcare, I think, is one of those very basic things that we consider to be fundamental to quality of life and how we are progressing as societies, but it's still varies so much in different parts of the world. And you've seen that firsthand. So what I'm really interested in is what you said before, that you're interested in almost going back and seeing how things have evolved. So I'm assuming you mean things in the country, healthcare system, but also the impact that you have made when you were there. I don't think many people would say that. I think many people are like, yep, tick that off onto the next, uh, almost closing the loop on um, how things are actually progressing and what kind of legacy you've left behind. Well, in some countries, of course, you cannot say how much legacy left behind. For me, it was more for Senegal, for example. I was just an eye-opener how the country massively changed in 10 years, mm. how they evolved and built. So that would be too ambitious to see how I, I left the footprint there in the programs I worked off with and looked after. Having said that, in Vanuatu, I took on the uh, position as the head pharmacist in Vanuatu, working through an all paid funding, the PACTAM program. I was intrigued by the job because the country is very small, about 200,000 people live there. And you could see, and I was guessing that I can see the impact of my work. So I was mandated to improve the, the procurement of drugs for the whole country to have uh, assured that uh, there's less stockouts in the country, a better distribution to the islands. There are about 80 islands where people live on with five hospitals. It's a very small landmass spread across the size of, of France, if you compare it. And so it's a kind of a, a massive logistical and financial um, 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 stretch. You have to try to, to things, bring things together. Mm. And having only a handful of people to work with and a very small Ministry of Health department there, I was seeing really the impact I had. And that was very rewarding. If you would go to a country like I compared like Brazil or other big countries, if I would work in the Ministry of Health of Brazil, uh, I think the wheels would move in the same speed and I wouldn't feel like I, have, I can make a difference. Maybe you can, but it's you barely would see it. Right. Yeah. And I can imagine that you were given a lot more agency being inside of Vanuatu in the role that you were in to be able to make changes that could like really transform the healthcare system there. Yeah. And we managed really to flush out most of the stockouts. My budget was $5 per person per year, per inhabitant. That means nearly $1 million for band-aids, for antibiotics, syringes, cotton wool, whatever you need in a hospital, in these five hospitals in this, and the health centers. We managed to double the amount with donations from abroad and to get rid of most of the stockouts. And you can imagine people just show up at the hospital when it's very late for small things, you don't show up in hospital. So it's it's a bit a different um, way to work than in other countries where people have smaller conditions, they already show up. We had one gynecologist in the whole country. Wow. We had <laughs> uh, one trained pharmacist in the whole country. The rest was people who we trained and we, we brought up to speed for certain workflows. So it was a bit of a improvisational work at all ends, but very rewarding because people really embraced the chances that also it gave them with financing this position and also financing some of the of the budget. And we had some expat doctors, so I had the chance to work with Australian doctors, um, New Zealand doctors, doctors from Cuba, Chinese doctors. So from all over the place, people came in and you realize how different these doctors work as well and how the, the way they work. And the biggest impression left the Cuban doctor. I was so impressed by the Cuban doctors I met all over the place about the quality of work. They're not necessarily um, used to work with the high end machineries and things we in, the, in Europe eventually work, but they they did a fabulous job with this improvising and working for what they have. And I think that's also a bit given from the background where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. They, they'd have to do more with less. I'm curious then. So when you enter a place like Vanuatu and or enter a new role or a new country, and you've done so many of these rotations where you're somewhere for six months and six months is a decent amount of time to really understand the culture how do you go about that? Like, where do you start in, you know, really getting into the core needs of that country, the maturity that they're in, the cultural norms that I can imagine guide a lot of your decisions as well? What's your kind of starting point to really immerse in that culture? 
well, I guess curiosity. There's some countries that that spark your curiosity by say, I want to know more about it. And then you start reading about it and, and think oh, that would be nice to be there. And in a way you, you have this imaginary tick off list. This will be a country I want to go to. This is a country to go to. And then sometimes you have a chance, something presents in front of you, say, oh, this Vietnam as an example. Somebody asked me, you have a project there. Do you, are you interested to go there to have a look for us at the program? And then I said, of, of course, immediately. And that's a bit the, uh, I talk my way, myself into these things somehow, because if you're too fast saying yes, then you have to do it because you said you want to do it. And thinking twice, sleeping three times around and saying, oh, should I really do it? It's a bit a uh, lot of work. You have to organize self, get, I don't know, you have a flat to organize or other things you want to, you cannot just abandon things for six months. Also your social life um, is a bit different then because you cannot just go to a wedding or other important family gatherings. But then at the end, you go there, you arrive at the country, you prepare with um, books, with uh, movies, whatever you, you find. And then you get the first thing you get is the, the excitement, the smells, the different smells, the heat, the, the humidity in the country, so the different food. And it's all exciting. It's all new. And then after a while, after a few days or weeks, eventually you get kind of a cultural shock. And you fall into a hole. And I had this all the time. I have to say this is, and I know it's always happening, that you think, why am I doing this? I'm missing out on that at home. My friends are doing this. And you have cravings for some food items or the things you miss from home. And you don't know yet how to get around and find your way in the countries. And then it starts slowly picking up. You find that there's this fabulous restaurant there. There's this great um, place you can just read or, or go online with a computer and or uh, you start learning the language and you realize that more and more you you can read things you can decipher things and this helps of course to get up with the mood and after a few months you it's like your your second skin in there when you are and feeling comfortable and Vietnam for example I said knowing that I went in through these phases I said first month I want to I want to stay with one month with a family and learn the basics of the language so I had the chance really to stay with them and live with them from morning till evening and learn um, the basics of Vietnamese eating with them the food and when you arrive in Vietnam they have no clue about the language it's like you feel like mm -hmm. a baby you cannot mm -hmm. even read uh, the, the signs on the street and then suddenly you realize this means hairdresser, this means grocery store, or you can ask for the bill or tell the tax driver to slow down <laughs> or go left <laughs> and right. And these are these this fabulous moments where you, you always have these successes. And the more of these successes come in and kick in, then the more happy you get. Yeah. And your comfort level, I can imagine, grows as well because it is a little bit, maybe not frightening, but uh, you're outside of your comfort zone when you're inside of a completely different culture where you can't speak the language and you feel like a little bit of an outsider. And as your confidence level grows, then your comfort level grows and you feel like you um, you can more confidently explore the country, I can imagine. But it's really interesting what you were saying about the dip that you get when you kind of come to a new place and then you like reality sets in essentially. And that culture shock really comes in as we were talking about this um, yesterday, actually, is the valley of disillusionment. I think a lot of people, when they think about venturing into another country to live there or to stay there for a long time, that's probably where their head automatically goes is that valley of it's going to be frightening. It's going to be foreign. I'm going to be by myself all of those kind of feelings of trepidation about how much outside your comfort zone you're going to be. And I really love that you're like each time that you go somewhere, you said that you feel you're in that valley, you're in that dip, but you still do it again and again. So it's, it's almost like a part of the journey that you know that you have to go through to get to that comfort level and to get the most out of the experience. Exactly. Like a reward. I guess it's like mm. running a triathlon. I never was running a marathon or mm. triathlon, but I guess it's the same. You have to go through some pain to get the excitement at the end. You did it. You managed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I like also when you said that you spent some time with a local family. So when you're in new places, do you try to stay away from the expats and you know, people who are potentially European or similar to you and try to really stay more with the locals? 
I would say I would try to stay away from toxic people, <laughs> like yes, people who, who eat yeah. away your energy. Yes. And I, um, when you travel or when you go to some places and you meet expats, I mean, expats, they, they could be, there's a variety, a big variety of expats. And I try to avoid those who are frustrated and kind of at the point where they don't, they don't really want to be where they are. In Vietnam, I had the chance, it was very early in my career to have a, there was a Swiss woman working there. She was uh, about... 20, 30 years older, and she just showed me how to explore the country or the, the city there and took me along said, this is here, this is that. And she knew exactly that these phases are coming through. So it was very helpful to have her at explaining me some of the things you cannot decipher on your own. Vietnam, for example, is such a different culture. Um, some things are so alien to you, even if you're there for two years, maybe you never get to the point where you understand some of the things. And so she, she could explain me these things. She was living there for ages. Out of fear, I think I would encourage everybody to mingle up as much as possible with, with the people in the country or the place. I mean, that's why you're there in the first place. And in Vanuatu, for example, um, I speak French and German and English. And in Vanuatu, people speak French or English. Okay. And most of the expats, they only speak English. And that was quite frustrating for the French speaking part of the country because they don't speak English. They speak Bislama or French and the other half speaks Bislama or English. And in the warehouse where I worked, half of the staff was French speaking and they have always felt neglected by every expat coming in, only speaking English. And I was the first addressing them also in French. And there was a big eye open of them where they said somebody speaking also French. And I went through the effort to learn Bislama. I took Bislama classes and speak a bit Pidgin English or learned a bit of Pidgin English, <laughs> which is superb language. It's, it's a funny yeah. language. Mm. And it's, I would say the English speakers avoided to speak Bislama because it's like feeling to, they destroyed their own language. It feels like a simplified version of, of English. It's not, but for me, it was more, more like I know all the bricks like Lego. I just have to put them differently together and I get a new language. And that was triggering me to, to get into this language. And also that was, is a huge door opener. If you try at least to speak the local language, that's a massive door opener. And it also shows the respect for the local situation and country that you at least give it a try. The better you get, the better. But if you want them to respect you or your work or what you maybe want to bring as your values, it helps certainly if you can speak a bit of language. Yeah, definitely. And in the places where you spent a shorter amount of time, you also, I think you mentioned that you try to pick up at least a few of the conversational words so that you can, I guess, communicate, obviously, but also show a bit of respect to the yes, places that you're absolutely. in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And I think it's also not only language, but also behaviors. If you go to some places and you have to dress up specially, you dress up specially. I hate ties and, and suits normally. <laughs> um, but if you meet a, a minister or a, an embassy and delegate, it's showing respect. So for me, dressing up is not dressing up for myself. It's dressing up for the other person that I show the respect. And if you meet with the Ministry of Health, you don't show up in short trousers. You don't show up bare feet unless it's the... It was in the South Pacific where I had some interesting meetings with people showing up bare feet of the ministry, bare feet and short trousers. But that was more because of the, the custom there. But if you in a different countries, um, especially in the Western Hemisphere, but also in Africa, you show the respect by dressing up appropriately. And yes, that's yeah. a, a signal and a sign. I like that, though, that you're you're really dressing for the other person, like particularly if you're a visitor in their country or inside of their home. It's a similar thing, I guess, to, you know, if you're in Japan and you take your shoes off before you enter a restaurant, it's, you know, it might be outside of what you're norm normally used to doing or your comfort zone, but it's a small, it's a small act. I did a massive mistake in Vietnam. I mean, sometimes you do things and you don't know that it's a mistake, but mm. being Swiss, I thought it's smart. You live with this family, you bring a Swiss pocket knife. Yeah. That's what you do as a Swiss. That's a nice present. That's something unique from Switzerland. It's, it's right. useful. So I gave the, the, the family head, the father who teach me Vietnamese for six hours a day, a month. I gave him this as a present and he became super silent, walked out of the room. Oh. And his wife then told me, well, it, it was not a good idea to give a knife. And I, uh, presenting somebody knife as a mm -hmm. present means you cut off the, the, the friendship. 
Oh, and I had no. no idea. So I I added some money to it. I had to, to place the money with the, with the <laughs> knife. So he gave me back then the money. He bought the knife and then it's okay. Oh, but if you just okay. give somebody a knife as present and then I told this story at home, my mom said, well, that's normal also in Europe. In some places you give, you never give a knife, you always hand a knife with some money. And I think it's, it's since then I became a bit more careful about uh, gifts and, and what you bring, even flower, color, colors of flowers or different flower types in different countries have total me different meanings. And I think if you are in a different country with a complete different culture, I think you should at least try to find out where the landmines are. And so speaking of that, one of the other things that I'd love to chat with you about is learning the landmines, essentially, is learning about the culture or even learning about, you know, not just the places that you go to, but the field that you're entering into or the company that you're starting to work with is yep. this natural love that you have for history. And again, it kind of goes back to when Marcel and I were in Basel and he was just giving me not only what am I looking at inside of the exhibition, but also like the history behind it, which just creates so much more depth in the story and in the context of what you're looking at. So how important is it for you to spend a little bit of time really going, you know, much further back to understand the context of what it is that you're dealing with by leveraging the history of it? I would say it applies to everything you do. If you go to talk to a person, if you visit a country, if you visit a city, or if you start to work at a new place, it's always helpful if you know a bit where they're coming from. It doesn't mean it's automatically indicating where the future lies or how the future goes, but it helps a bit to, to see where the main influences are coming from. and. Think about the country, you visit the country, if you know the history of the country, it helps to see if you see a church, if you talk to people, where they're coming from, if they had a different political system, if they had uh, wars, if they had uh, different views on things, then it can be explained. It doesn't mean you have to agree necessarily with it, but it gives you some hints. And the same I did with uh, companies when I started to work for company, I want to know where they're coming from. What is the history behind it? And for example, when I worked with um, philanthropic programs and an NGO and CSR work, corporate social responsibility, it is certainly good to know what is the history of the company to a bit shape the future of the company. You cannot just change the narrative and turn around 180 degrees unless there's a certain reason you change completely your business model or your products. But it's it's always helpful to know a bit where we're coming from. The thing about Nokia, the company who was becoming famous for the mobile phones, they started as a rubber boot company. And it doesn't mean you have to stay a rubber boot company, but somehow it shows that they could massively change the business model. And, and there was a reason for that, I guess. I never yeah. worked for Nokia, by the way, but I think it's an interesting story that they changed completely. So I was thinking... Would they also change, change the complete the workforce or the way the workforce thinks? I don't think so. I think there was a reason why they, they were innovative and changed their model. And the same applies to, to us. We have been in the food business, so to speak. Ovaltin was part of our portfolio at Novartis. And in the thinking of healthy food, I grew up as Ovaltin just being convenient food, a, a chocolate drink, basically, you pour some Ovaltine in, a, in milk and that becomes turns into a nice chocolate drink. But the history showed that it was a, a food ingredient that helps people to get faster, strong, sick people to get faster on their feet. Mm -hmm. And it like turned into convenience food. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So these stories are not necessarily changing the way you work, but it helps to explain how you work and why you work. And if you want to convince, I guess, also your colleagues and, and workforce about some changes you want to say, yeah. you, you have a handrail we set somehow mm -hmm. that guides you a bit what could be the next step. Yeah, I really like that. The handrail as you're going up the stairs is history and the, the context that you're playing in. But what's really interesting also is that you, like clearly you like to come in with a very fresh perspective, like you it seems to me like you almost like to collide two things is the way that things were or the way that things are with the way that they could be, or even colliding two very different industries or two different ways of thinking and connecting dots between things that seemingly don't have a connection is almost like the 
immersion into the history and the context of something while also coming in with a very fresh perspective and kind of looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. How much does that kind of play a role in how you operate day to day? Massively. <laughs> um, I, I love to find unusual solutions. Somehow that sparks my interest. And if it's too much of the same old uh, as a solution, I'm not too much excited about it. It doesn't really excite me. But if there's something new, if I spot some new angles to it, it creates that that curiosity to learn more about it. And the same applies if you travel with the language. It is, if you see somehow a new angle to it, then the more interest you create for something, the better you become in learning it. If you're not interested in playing the piano, it will be a nightmare to learn the piano. But somehow if you think I can play one day in front of my friends or I can compose, then you have the, the right spark that triggers your, your interest to learn more about it. So that's one thing why, how I motivate myself. I try to see new angles. And on the other hand, I try to combine things that are not, like you said, normally not meeting in the wild. And this crossover is completely new inspiration. I started pharmacy, but I said I... I I didn't mention that I did a, an MBA, an executive MBA in St. Gallen. So I brought to get a bit of a financial backpack with a pharmaceutical backpack, a pharmacist backpack. And not many pharmacists study or have also insights into economy, I think. And that crossover gets interesting. And when I talk to some colleagues or friends who ask me, what could, could I do? What is interesting? I always try to to move their thinking into a way, say, you have this unique experience, you have this unique background, how can you combine this? You have a background, you're from Nepal, you speak Nepali, you have, a, you, you started this and that. Maybe you want to combine these two things, two features you already have that you never thought of bringing together. And of course, if you have different cultural backgrounds or different language, that's an easy thing. But sometimes it's a easy, it's a no-brainer. If you have um, different language skills and a certain education, you can bring it together. Sometimes it's harder to to combine these things if you're you think you don't have special skills or special know-how, but then why not go in the extra mile and get this extra know-how that makes you unique? If you study a normal university study, many other people have the same study. So what is the unique identifier for yourself? How would you say this is how it positions me differently by traveling to different countries, by working in different fields and then yeah. bringing these things together. So that's what's triggering me. How can I make this more exciting for me? Yeah. Or, yeah. or also for the exhibition, for example, when we created this exhibition, I loved always science museums and science centers. So I visited them all over the place from Boston to San Francisco. And I loved especially the American science museums. <laughs> they were very inspirational. And mm -hmm. so I thought, how can I bring this kind of, of hands-on experience that American museums are much better into our field, that we can touch things, you can shake it, rattle around and turn it. And whereas the European museums more, or in the older museums, um, you, you display things, but you cannot play with it. Right. And so I think that bringing this together, the, that was a nice um, inspiration to see how the this American Science Center did this. Yeah, definitely gain inspiration by kind of going outside of what you're familiar with. And I also like your point about leveraging what is unique about you and your background, your experience, but then also pushing yourself to stretch into new areas, which is connected into what you mentioned before, which I really love. I wrote it down. So you say, you said, say yes, immediately commit yourself and then you're committed. So go and make it happen. So I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think just very scary for a lot of people, like a lot of people stay in the same field that they started off in, they kind of go down a very traditional career trajectory or they stay in the country that they were born in or similar like countries. Or there, I think just a lot of people are generally scared to take risk. Risk comes with, you know, consequence, but it can also come with incredible rewards. So how do you overcome your fear when you're thinking about committing to something new? Do you just sign up and go, I'll deal with the fear later? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's, I think when you just say yes at the beginning, you don't realize how much work comes with it to, right. to, to get to a new place, to make new things. Yeah. So sometimes it's, it's, I think also being blind for these things or <laughs> just um, ignorant. And then mm -hmm. you realize, um, boy, I said yes, and now I have to do it. 
So sometimes it's smarter to, to wait a few days and get some time to think over it and then fine tune the response. But that's that's me. That's that's not an advice not to do it. <laughs> what I realize is with friends who started with me, when we talk and meet once in a while, they say, oh, boy, you did this. And I also wanted to travel. And now it's too late. And they they were staying 20, 30 years in their profession and then have the feeling like I missed out on something. And you asked me before if I would like if I missed the traveling now or if I would like to go somewhere else. And I think that's giving me this good feeling not to travel because I did a lot of things before. I was really blessed with a lot of opportunities. And this gives me the the ease to say, this is perfect now. I'm enjoying it because mm. I saw so many other things. And if you don't know what's out there or there are other things, it's more like you have these dreams or ideas. This could be something that, and I think that's creating these frustrations of some people going into a bore out after 20, 30 years in the same career. <laughs> Somebody said once, a career is like a ladder. You climb up and you realize after a while that it's leaning to the, towards the wrong wall. <laughs> so, and then you cannot go back. You cannot just switch. And, and in a way, sometimes I feel I was jumping around in so many fields that I, I envy people who had one single track and they're happy with it. So I, I could not imagine being happy, happy at, with the same career at the same place for the last 20, 30 years, just moving up this ladder. It depends a bit on, on who you are and what you expect, I guess, from, yeah. from life or work and I think that's very true. But I think, you know, a lot of the times when you push yourself into something that takes you down a complete deviation to your plan or outside of what you maybe had expected of yourself. So maybe beyond what even you thought your own capability was to deal with the situation or to deal with a new skill that you're building. I think you need those moments of almost like pressure testing your own capability. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but in every case, at least, I found that you never regret it. You don't regret the risks that you take or you, if you assess the risks carefully, hopefully, um, and evaluate your decisions carefully, you're always challenged in the most positive way as a person. And I can imagine with the like breadth of experience that you've had, there probably isn't one, any one of those that you regret doing or undertaking. Not really. I think I should have pushed for more experiences. Oh, um, somehow you, if the, the, I guess when you start your career, you don't have an imagination what's out there and you are shy a bit and you could do much more, I think. And in, in Vanuatu, for example, I had some students contacting me. They wanted to do a kind of a, a local two, three months um, internship, they called it, or or uh, working as students there. And at the beginning said, no, pff, this is quite some work to get them organized and I have to control what they do. And, and then said, wait a minute, they are asking for getting out there, doing something hands-on. And I have so many ideas what we can do here. I need some more hands to help me. And there was the best decision ever. I had three, four students from New Zealand, from Australia also, and from Switzerland. And they just were super happy to have this experience. And this was a door opener for their career afterwards. And I had people who, who, who are running in the same direction as I was, and I could do much more with them than I could have done alone. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes it's saying yes to the opportunities that present themselves. But then the other thing that you said to me yesterday, which was really powerful, was sometimes you, to the point you made before, you don't even know what you don't know. Like you need to almost remain very open to the things that will surprise you, the things that aren't on your radar at all. Yes, yes. Yeah. So for me, I, I said always I have a bucket list of two, three hundred items I want to do. And it's not I'd have to work down everything and then it's done. It's more like these are the things I would like to do with the time I have left. And if I take off one box, it's replaced with a new box. So I will never work this down. And this means I, I have to keep my radar open for all these things. And if an opportunity presents, um, I think you have to use this opportunity and say, this is a, what I should do or, or visit or see. This can be a, a fair, this can be um, a special cultural celebration. He said, I want to always see this to visit a certain mountain restaurant. It's not necessarily on career. It's about events, about places, about venues. And this keeps your, I think, your, your brain sharp. Yeah. And people as well, right? Engage with a broad interesting, diverse set of people that also keeps your brain sharp. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, I wouldn't say collect people, but I love to meet new people and, and interact with them. Interacting means listen to them, their presentations. We have several venues now also in our place, Novartis Pavio, where we invite scientists to talk about science, latest know-how and insights about brain stroke to whatever other topics and things I never heard, heard about before. I'm learning since since I started, I mean, it, before I started, but the, the last 30 years, I was blessed to learn on uh, all topics I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And we often say that time is our most precious thing on earth. And we, we weigh up so carefully what we do with our time. But I think t- taking the time to learn and to take yourself outside of what you're normally looking at is is such a valuable use of our time. Which leads me very nicely to my last question for you, Marcel, which is what your go-to is when you're trying to do that, when you're trying to look at something completely different to get yourself outside of your comfort zone and look outside. So I started to become a passionate beekeeper (laughs) and um, I always wanted to do this for years, but it was too complicated. I always said, I'm never going to uh, get how this works. It's mm. a it's a whole beehive. It's not one animal you have to uh, also work with. And because I was traveling so much, I never dared to start that because you have to really take care of these animals or what even you can consider a beehive as one animal. And so I started this be- just before COVID, in fact. And this is really my place to go to to settle down a bit and and to be in the now and uh, here on the yet, as we say, in the now and the exact moment in the moment because when you open a beehive you work with them you have to to interpret what you're doing you cannot say oh in one week i will do this and that you have to be in the moment and this helps me a bit to to focus also to refresh for me one hour the beehive is like one week of holidays mm. it's a smell it's a very intensive experience it's a the, the noise the smell that the taste everything is sticky everything you touch is sticky so you have to be careful how you work and they they don't like if you mess around too much so it's it's something you have to be in the moment and that's helping me to to focus then re- later on again well, particularly for someone like you, who I can imagine your brain is always constantly going and thinking about new things and planning for what's ahead. Um, out of curiosity, have you been bitten by stung? Sorry, stung by a bee? Yeah, several times, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but not too much. I'm, I have to say, I always wear the gear. Just mm-hmm. I, uh, You don't have to wear it all the time, but uh, sometimes you misinterpret how they are. And if they're really grumpy, uh, it can be really a painful experience. So I buy, buy just by... I started to have the attitude to just put my gears up, my the nets, you know, the gloves um, as a normal habit, the habit that I was also looking for. So I started to, um, as a habit, to dress with my, the, the gowns and the, the gloves. And sometimes they sting through the gloves, but not as, as strong as if you don't have the gloves. So I would say per year I have 15, 20 bee stings. Sometimes wow. one managed to get into your sleeve or your 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 shoes and then something happens. But I see there's a treatment and um, I think it's a good thing for your body if you're not staying, staying too much. But once in a while, it doesn't matter. And it reminds you of um, you didn't work carefully. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why you have to be very present in the moment and do, you yeah. know, really focus on what you're doing. And at the end, you get rewarded with some honey at least. So yeah. it's, it's a low price. I pay for that. Marcel, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you for being a part of it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review or share the show. And I will see you next time. Until then, keep looking outside.